to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse number 8. We welcome you today to our study of the books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. In these beautiful books, Paul will encourage these Christians to never give up, to never give in, and to keep pressing toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And friend, that's our message of encouragement today. As we strive every day to live for the Lord. Don't let anything get in the way of us living faithful to the Master each and every day. And so we're in, we hope to encourage you, and we are indeed encouraged, knowing that hopefully you've got your Bible ready and that you will be following along in the Word of God as we study the Scriptures today. Friend, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by congregations and individual members of the churches of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, if you'd like to know more about the church, that you'd be their honored guest, whether it be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday, they would love to have you anytime. Won't you drop by and visit the local church, the local congregation of the Lord's people in your area? And friend, we want you to know here at the Gospel of Christ, our main emphasis is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We're concerned about men and women going to heaven. And friend, we're so happy that you've joined us today. If you'd like to study the Word of God further, please check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have hundreds of lessons recorded on lessons recorded on every book of the Old and New Testament and a wide variety of topics and they're all available free of charge 24 7 check out our videos listen to our audios we've got transcripts we've got study questions a wide variety of good Bible study tools are available in fact if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons you can download that from our website for free or if you need a hard copy on DVD or CD Fill out a media request form and we'll send it to you free of charge. Today, we're going to be studying a very powerful and very encouraging message from 1 Thessalonians chapters 3, 4, and 5. And while these messages may be very concise and, and very uh, brief in their covering of these, we'll cover a wide variety of topics which we hope will lift up and encourage each and every one of us. And friend, as we do this, let's begin by realizing this. Every one of us, myself included, every one of us, from time to time, needs to be strengthened and encouraged in our faith. You know, sometimes we need a shot in the arm, don't we? Well, where do we get that from spiritually? Notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it to be good to be left in Athens alone. And notice what Paul did, though. And sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. Paul couldn't go there. Just wasn't any way at this point, but he had a plan. He was going to give these Christians a shot in the arm. What was it? He said, I'm sending Timothy. He's going to talk to you and encourage you in the gospel of Christ and strengthen and encourage your faith. And so as Christians, how can we be strengthened and encouraged? Friend, as we fight the good fight of faith, we're strengthened and encouraged every day as we put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 17, as we arm ourselves with God's armory and God's tools, the devil can't get in if we've got that on. We strengthen and encourage ourselves as no doubt Timothy was going to do. 
with God's Word. Listen to this passage. The Bible says, you talk about the power of the Word of God, here it is. The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4 verse 12, and thus the Word of God. When I read my Bible, you want to find encouragement? Read your Bible. You want to find help? Be listening to and, and, and hearing others preach and teach the Word of God and give yourself to the Bible. But you know how else we find encouragement? In others. Don't you know when Timothy knocked on that door in Thessalonica, their hearts jumped and they were lifted up by his presence. The encouragement we receive from other people is such an important part of being a Christian. Paul said, be aware, watch out, lest there be any of, you and any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but encourage or exhort one another daily and so much more as we see the day approaching. Hebrews 3 verses 12 and 13 and Hebrews chapter 10 verse number 24. A Christian friends, Christian family gathering together with the Lord's church. Other people have the power to encourage me as well. But here's another way we're encouraged. We're also encouraged in prayer. Luke 18, 1, Jesus said, Men ought always to pray and never lose heart. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man encourages uh, or uh, helps, helps us to overcome the problems of life. And so utilize the power of prayer as well. But you know, even when we do have that encouragement, Friend, we've got to realize that sufferings and trials are going to be a part of life, but don't let them 28. shake your faith. That's what Paul will say next. Notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know, listen to this, that we are appointed to this, for in fact, we told you before when we were with you, that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know. Paul says, don't let this shake your faith. This is not something that ought to surprise you or ought to catch you off guard. We told you ahead of time, you know what's going to happen in being a Christian. Trials, troubles, and difficulties from time to time are going to happen. It's how we face those that makes us who we are. Whether they're going to happen or not is not even a question. They're going to happen. But how we face them and what we do with them is what makes Christians unique. How does a Christian face trials? James told us, did he not? Here's the opposite of the way the world looks at it. My brethren, count it all, listen to this word, joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Knowing the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete and perfect, lacking in nothing. I can face trials with joy. Why? Because ultimately the devil's been defeated. Defeated. I'm a child of God, and no matter what happens, God's going to provide a way of escape, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and I have heaven as my ultimate goal. And friend, I can use those trials to get closer to God. Psalm 119 verse 67, the psalmist says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Verse number 72 of Psalm 119, he said this. This is where it's unique for a Christian. It is good for me that I've been afflicted, that I may keep your statutes. We can see the positive help in our trials, and we don't have to let them shake our faith. If I know it's going to happen, if, God's, if I know I've been prepared for it by God, and I know there's more to what I'm doing than just this life, trials and tribbles and trou troubles and tribulations cannot cause me to give up on God and the beautiful plan that He has for us. All right, let's move ahead to chapter 4. And I want us to notice something else about Christianity and, and, and living our faith every day, and it's this. Part of living that faith, that faith which knows trials are going to arise, also means we live in purity every day. Look at Paul's words to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number 3. For this is the will of God, 
your sanctification, notice now, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. One of the things that we've got to do to make sure we can impact the world and really live our best for God is to live free from the moral and the immoral and ungodly problems that our world is faced with. When I think about this idea, I want you to notice the key word in First Thess Thessalonians 4 verse 3. It's the same word found in 1 Peter 2 verse number 11 where Peter will say, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, you ought to underline this in your Bible, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Paul will say in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3, abstain from sexual immorality. Friend, God's word, when it relates to immoral things, is abstinence. Can a Christian have a little bit of sin? Can a Christian go up and have a little bit of immorality? Will a little bit of uh, ungodliness be okay? It's not the way it works. Abstinence is God's plan. Now, friend, am I saying we're perfect? That's not the idea. We all sin. There's no doubt that we, we do things that are not right. But I want to do my best to abstain from it. And when I do sin, I want to repent and pray that the evil thought of my heart or action might be forgiven. Acts chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. And so this is why Paul was saying in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 11 and 12, we want to walk properly toward those who are in the world or outside. I've got to think about my influence and the impact that my life has on other people. Friend, think about this. Do we realize, do we really understand that when we're Christians, people are watching us? Acts 4 verse 13, of the disciples it is said, they realized they had been with Jesus. They were watching them. People know I'm a Christian. People know you're a Christian. And more harm can be done to the cause of Christ by, by people who others, they know they're Christians and they go to church on Sunday and then they go out and live like the devil the rest of the week. What kind of influence will that have on other people? You know what they're going to say? They're going to say, that old boy, he ain't nothing but a hypocrite. Why should I go to that church? Why should I become a Christian? He claims to be a Christian, and then he goes out and lives worse than everybody else. We've got to think about our influence and the way the world might see Christians. But then let's do this. I want us to think about, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to talk more about the coming of the Lord and some principles related to that because that's a big part of what 1 Thessalonians is all about, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. But friend, one of the things that we have to do to really live our faith and be the type of person God wants us to be is we've got to have the right kind of respect. We ought to for God, His leaders, and His authority. And thus, Christians in the local congregation are taught to respect those who are over them that would be no doubt the elders, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and verse 17. Notice what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12 and 13. But we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who are over you. We urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Well, who is it that is over us? I know the Lord's over me, there's no doubt. Christ has all authority. Matthew 28, verse 18. I also know that in the local congregation, God has set forth elders, also seen in the Bible as overseers or pastors in the New Testament, elders. They're over us. What's that mean? I am to submit to and obey them. Hebrews 13 verse 7 and verse 17. As those who watch out for my souls and they'll give an account on the day of judgment. And so as, as shepherds, overseers, elders, they have an awesome responsibility. But I also have a responsibility in that. If the local congregation is going to be what God wants it to be, I've got to obey those in places of leadership. 
Now friend, that doesn't mean, please hear me well today, that doesn't mean that I may think every decision is what I would do or every decision is even necessarily what's necessarily right, but you know what it does mean? I'm talking about in matters of expediency, okay? I may not necessarily say, well, that, that, that's the best thing ever, but you know what? I can get behind it and I can obey and I can help. And friend, that's going to do a whole lot more than standing in the background and murmuring and complaining. And thus, Paul's now going to make some practical application for Christians in Thessalonica about what they can do to make their lives the best they could ever be. And some of these are just real simple short statements. But friend, I promise you, if we'll put these into practice in our life, Boy, you talk about making the best life ever. This is it. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number 15. What can we do to make our lives the best they can be? Look at what Paul says to these Christians. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. What can we do to have the best life that we could ever have as a Christian? You don't return evil for evil. You know, the old saying that we often think about is, don't get mad, get even. Meaning that if you uh, cut me off in traffic or you run me off the road, well, guess what? I get to do that to you as well. That's not the Christian attitude. The Christian attitude is totally different than that. We return good for evil, according to Romans chapter 12. That is what is so unique. Someone may be mean to us and be unkind to us and do things that are not right and although we might could and even worse do something back to them we do the opposite we say you know what I hope God blesses you we say is there anything I could do to help you we say do you know about the best life you could ever live found in Jesus Christ and in love and kindness we don't return evil for evil we return good for evil. And friend, I promise you, you talk about making a change and impact in our world and the world in general, principles like that will do so much good to help that. All right, another principle that'll make your life so much better is this. Look in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number 16. A very short statement, Paul says this, Rejoice always. Isn't that a powerful principle? You want to have the best life you could ever have? You want to find happiness and peace and tranquility? Then, friend, you've got to find ways to rejoice always. Now, both those words connected. You have to put both of them together for it to work, okay? You can't just go around and, and, and be happy part of the time or some of the time or most of the time. You've got to rejoice always. Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. There's another key. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And sometimes that takes work. You know, some days, and in some situations, boy, it's real easy to be happy when everything's going right. But what about when it's not? That's where we've got to work at it to be happy and to rejoice. Like Paul. Acts 16, verse 25, Paul and Silas are in a prison in Philippi. And what are they doing? Moping and moaning and woe is me? No. They're praying and they're singing hymns to God and the prisoners are listening to them. Friend, if you'll find something, and you can, even in the darkest situations, we can find something to be happy about or rejoice about. If you'll find something to rejoice about in every situation, it'll make life so much easier. All right, here's another powerful principle for effective Christian living, and it's this. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Paul will say, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 17 and 18, in everything give thanks. Pray without ceasing. What can we do to have the best life ever? Utilize the power of prayer. Hebrews 4, 16 says this. Here's why. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. When I think of the life of Christ and what made Jesus such a powerful teacher. Well, Jesus was a man of prayer. In the morning, a great while before daylight, he departed to a solitary place and there prayed. Just stop and think about the times Jesus spent in prayer. He would go to the mountain alone and pray. He would get up early and pray. In John 17, he would pray to the Father. 
in the Garden of Gethsemane. He spent time in prayer. Pray without ceasing. Don't ever, that doesn't mean that everything you do is prayer, but it does mean there ought not to ever be a time in my life when I can't turn to God in prayer and find great strength and encouragement. Now, here's a powerful principle for effective living. Find something to be thankful about all the time. In everything, give thanks. Luke, Jesus tells a story about this that I think makes such a powerful impact on us today. In about, verse, uh, in about Luke 17, verses 11 through 18, 10 lepers came to Jesus, and, and these lepers, you can't begin to imagine how hard their life was. Not only did they have a dreaded disease, the leprosy would be awful and, and something that you had to deal with constantly every day. Not only was that a dreaded disease, but friend, lepers were isolated. They had nobody. They lived outside the camp, outside of having one another, and you can imagine what that might be like to around other people who had the same problem and were complaining and moaning like you all the time. They had nobody. They were ostracized from their family, from the camp of Israel. But Jesus healed those ten lepers, just like that. Ten lepers came to Jesus. They're all automatically healed by the Lord. And Jesus tells them to go their way, do what the Old Testament said, show themselves to the priest to make an offering. And you know what's really heartbreaking about that story? One leper came back to thank the Lord. And you know what Jesus said in Luke 17? Where are the nine? Didn't every one of them have something to be thankful about? And friend, when I look at my life, don't I have so much to be thankful about? We live in the blessed, most blessed country in all the world. We have so much to be thankful for. Roof over our head, food to eat, clothes to wear, uh, good transportation most of us have. When I think about the blessings of God, you know, we, need, we sing the song, Count Your Many Blessings. And just doing that and giving thanks in everything will definitely help and encourage each and every one of us in everything that we say and do. And then Paul will say this, you, don't want to, you want to have a, the most effective life you could ever have? Don't put out the fire God's put in you. Look in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number 19. Here's what the scripture says. Again, just kind of a very simple statement, but Paul says this, Do not quench the Spirit. Friend, when, I think about, when you think about the fire that each one of us has, and we do have a fire, right? Jeremiah 20, verse 9. Jeremiah said, His word was in my heart, down in my bones, like a burning fire shut up in me. Jeremiah said, I was weary and could not put it out, couldn't hold it back. Each one of us has a fire for God. And by fire, we mean a spiritual excitement. Uh, we're so thankful to God for what God's done. Don't quench that spiritual fire. Now, no doubt, some of the application in the first century may have been that God's Spirit was working in powerful ways in the churches in the first century, and if they would work along with God and His Spirit, great things would be done. But friend, we have that same word today, and we have a spiritual fire burning within each one of us. Don't quench it. Don't let the world douse cold water on it. Don't let uh, sin cause us to have a lack of a fervor for serving God, and whatever it takes, don't grow apathetic for the cause of Christ. There was a congregation of the Lord's people in the New Testament that did that, the church in Laodicea. And Jesus said of that congregation, I, I, I wish that you would be cold or hot because you're neither cold nor hot and you're just kind of tepid or lukewarm. Jesus said, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Friend, don't take this the wrong way, but please understand, lukewarm Christianity makes Jesus want to vomit. It makes the Lord sick to his stomach. Why? Because a, a fire at one point or another has been put within each one of us and it is that spiritual fire and excitement that's going to make Christianity go around the world. And we need that passion for serving God today. Another principle that we want to close with today that will make Christianity so effective in our lives is this. We've got to have the attitude that we're going to check 
and we're going to prove everything before we give our stamp of approval to it, God's stamp of approval to it. Found in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21, this is such a powerful statement. Paul would say, test or prove all things, then hold fast that which is good. Abstain from every appearance of evil. Verse number 22 would say, does the Christian have a responsibility to check things? You bet he does. Friend, let's just say that somebody gets up and says, a Christian can go out and, and live this way. And someone holds a Bible in their hand and said, this is what the Bible teaches. Is my responsibility to accept that automatically, hook, line, and sinker? Of course not. That's what's wrong with a lot of the world religiously today. Somebody stands up in religious garb, and look like they're religious, and they say, this is what God says. And millions of people, without even checking it in their own Bible, buy into that. Friend, before we endorse and practice something as a Christian, before we believe and buy into something doctrinally, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Friend, that is one of the very reasons God gave us the Bible. Test the spirits to see whether they are of God. Why? Many false prophets have gone out into the world. Check the scriptures daily. Acts 17, 11, 1 John 4, verses 1 through 4. And so we hope today that Paul's message of encouragement for Christians in Thessalonica has been encouragement to us today for faithful living to the Lord. If you're not a child of God, more than anything, we want you to become one. Have you heard the message? There is a Savior. His name is Jesus, Romans 10, 17. Do you believe He's the way, the truth, and the life? John 14, verse 6. Would you turn from sin to God in repentance? Luke 13, 3. Would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Acts 2, verse 38. Rising out of that water to walk in newness of life. May each one of us be encouraged to stand firm in our faith and never ever give up. Please join us next time as we study the book of 2 Thessalonians together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.